Good morning. Good to see each of you here this morning. Glad that we're here together to worship our, our God in spirit and truth. It's so amazing that we can do that. It's amazing because Jesus has allowed that to happen. And we're here because of Jesus. We're here because of what He has done for you and me, that He has provided us life eternal because of His great love toward us. And so we're very thankful to be here. And I am thankful. I have the privilege every Sunday to come and preach to you, my brethren. And I'm thankful that I can do that. I, it is indeed a privilege. It's an honor for me to do so. And I thank you that you have counted me worthy to do just that. And so uh, I've heard over and over how this congregation is more like a family than a church. And I found that to be true. This is truly a family of God. A family of God that meets in this building every Lord's Day. And I look forward to that every Lord's Day morning. So I say thank you to you and to everybody. We have been in a series of lessons coming from the book of Exodus about how God sets us free. And we've looked at various ways of how He has done that by using the platform of the book of Exodus. And really we've been focusing upon the first portion of the book of Exodus. And we got now into focusing upon the life of Moses. But as we think about how God sets us free, in one way, which we'll be talking about, is the idea that God has set us free from unbelief. Unbelief. And we'll talk more about that. But He has set us free from unbelief. And He has helped parents along the way to avoid unbelief. He has helped individuals along the way to avoid unbelief. And some of you are saying, just what is unbelief? Well, it's the opposite of belief. <laughs> but it doesn't necessarily mean that you do not believe in God. Moses believed in God. And yet, he could not enter into the promised land, the Bible tells us, because of his unbelief. Oh, he believed in God. But what did he do? He disobeyed God. God told him to speak to the rock. And Moses took it upon himself to strike that rock with his staff. And God said, that was an arrogant act. It was an arrogant act on his part. First of all, he didn't follow what God said. But second of all, he put the burden of the people of Israel upon his own shoulders. And God said that's not what he needed to do. And so he could not enter into the promised land because of unbelief. We turn into the book of Hebrews chapter 3. The Bible talks about those who were in the wilderness who fell into unbelief. And so they fell into disobedience. A disobedience that led to rebellion against God and against Moses. And they would not enter his rest. That is, they would not be saved, but they were condemned because of their unbelief. And so we have an Old Testament scripture that's provided by a New Testament writer, which gives us all a scripture that we have to apply to our lives. And the application is, be free from unbelief. Be free from disobedience that leads to rebellion. And one of the greatest themes in all the Bible is the freedom that you and I enjoy together. God desired mankind to live in freedom. To live in freedom. But God, as He put man in the garden, watched man walk away from that freedom. It was mankind that turned his back on God, not God turning his back on mankind. And mankind walked away from God because of unbelief, disobedience. Oh, they believed in the existence of God. They talked to Him face to face. He was with them every day in the garden. 
but they fell into unbelief. That is, if you believe in God, do what he says. They didn't do what he says, so therefore they were in unbelief. And they paid the consequence for their unbelief. And because of their sin, we also suffer the consequence of their sin. Not the guilt of their sin, the consequence of their sin. We are not guilty because they were guilty. But we are guilty because of our own sins. But our sins, just like their sins, brings forth death. Death. It was death that entered the world when Adam and Eve sinned. And from that point forward, we, we are all subject to death. And you have your first parents to thank for that, sadly. But as we think about the freedom, the freedom was in the beginning that you can eat of every tree that I've ever made here in the garden. Have at it. Except this one. So what did we do? We went after that one. And it changed the world forever. And then we fast forward to the New Testament in John chapter 8, beginning at about verse 36. The Bible tells us, If the Son of Man makes you free, you are free indeed. Isn't that a blessing? Doesn't that bring you joy to your heart and to your mind? It ought to give you assurance, the fact that Jesus died for your sins. You put Jesus Christ on in baptism. You have been a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ all your lives. And you have freedom. Because it's the Son that makes you free. Not you who makes you free. But the Son. He's made each one of us free. Free, of course, from unbelief. We don't have to go into unbelief. Now you look at what we talked about last week concerning Moses. And there we find in chapter 1 that, Moses, or that Pharaoh had wanted to kill the babies. It always turns out to be the baby's fault. But he wanted to kill the babies, but the handmaidens, those two faithful women said, No, not going to do that. And so Pharaoh got aggravated because those two women would not follow his orders. So what does he do? He says, I'm going to do complete genocide. I'm going to take every baby from the Hebrews, every newborn, and toss them into the Nile River. Imagine that. This was the type of man the Jews were living under. This was the culture and the society they found themselves in. And so picture yourself as a parent. Picture yourself as Amram and uh, Jehoshaphat, the parents of Moses. Think of yourselves as them. What would you do? Now, we come to the story of these parents. But as we, before we get to the story of the parents of Moses, I'm reminded of a story of a woman who was traveling with her eight children, all under the age of 12, on a 15-hour flight. And when they landed, they were going through customs. And the customs agent said to the woman, Are you carrying any guns or drugs? And the mother looked him sternly in the eyes and said, if I was, don't you think I would have used them by now? Uh, I love that one. And so we find here, sometimes parents need help. Parents do need help. But we all get help from the very same source, God and God's Word. To get help from God is because you have turned to God's Word. And by turning to God's word, you gain strength. Strength to overcome. We just sang the song, faith is the victory. Well, where do we get our faith from? God's word. And we continue in God's word. 
And the longer we continue in God's word, the stronger our faith becomes. So you see the connection between the word and your spiritual lives. You can't separate the two. You have to have the word in your life in order for you to have faith, continued faith, against the attacks of the enemy, Satan. And he does attack and will attack because as the Bible tells us, he walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And just before God handed Job over to the devil, the Bible tells us that he was walking back and forth to and fro upon the earth looking for souls. That's what he does. And because you are Christ's, he wants you the most. And if you're a parent today, you know that for sure. Look at the culture about us. Look at the children. And look at the grandchildren. What they're having to put up with in their school systems. It's not about creation, but it's about evolution. It's about a big bang. It's about diminishing human life to the point that not only did you evolve, but you evolved from pond scum. That's who you are. That's your identity. Oh no, it's not. Parents, uh, friends and brethren know this. Your identity is not there. Your identity is there. Your identity is with Jesus Christ. That's who you are. Nothing less than that. And parents, we need to stand up against culture and tell that to culture. You need to imbibe that from the Word of God and to stand up and tell the enemy, my child is not identified with pond scum. My child does not identify with being a form of a monkey. My child identifies with the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the creator. And he created all human life. Distinct from animal life. We need to stand up and take charge of the direction of this country. And where it is taking our children. There are far too many children leaving the church. You know... Part of evolution says it's only the strong survives. It's the survival of the fittest. So if you are strong and you can, you can take away from the weak, then you've won. That's how they teach. So only the strong survives. So if a child is influenced by that, guess what they do? I need to be strong and I need to survive. And so therefore, my best way of survival is taking from someone who's weaker. That's not what God taught in his word. That contradicts everything about Jesus Christ. That contradicts altogether God's word. And so we pick up the story in Exodus chapter 2. And a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived, Jehochabed, or Josabed, Jehochabed, Amron, Jehochabed. You can read about them later. But they were the parents of Moses. Amron marries Jehochabed. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, some translations say no ordinary child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him and daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. So we have Amram, and we have Jehochabed, and now we have Miriam, his sister. His sister Miriam. She plays a great part 
in a great role in this salvation story, a story of deliverance, a story of setting free. And then, of course, they had another child. His name was Aaron. And so we have Amram, Jehochebed, Miriam, and Aaron. And now we have Moses, and the mother has decided that she's going to protect her child. But going back to the verse that says, she conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. I want to know what woman in this audience ever said that their child was ugly. Ain't nobody ever said their child was ugly, and that's true. But the thing about it is, God loves all children. And God desires them to rise up as adults and to become obedient adults and to be followers of His Son, Jesus Christ. And so parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, you deserve a lot of credit because parenting is the hardest job you'll ever love. It's, you love it, Because your child is a gift from God. What a gift it is. What a blessing. It's hard. Because Satan throws everything at your child. And threatens your child's life. Spiritual well-being. Because of all the culture that comes the child's way. And we think about what's happening. We're thinking about... The idea that the Bible condemns homosexuality. But culture says, no, it's great. (laughs) Let's have more of it. In fact, let's have so much more of it that we want our children uh, to remove their genitals genitals and become the person they want to be. Whether they want to be a man or whether they want to be a woman. Our children are being taught this. But of course, we point to homosexuality. But what about heterosexuality? What about the promiscuity that goes on in this country every day among men and women, among the non-married, among the married and the non-married, and all the adultery and the fornication that takes place every day? Yes, we speak out against homosexuality, But I don't think we speak out hardly enough against the promiscuity among heterosexual beings. We need to talk about that. Sex was designed by God for two people, the male and the female, in marriage. That's where sex belongs. That's the institution of marriage. And that's where sex was designed to be. Nowhere else. And so we kind of, we watch the movies and we watch the TV. We know friends and we know our relatives and all of that. And we know that their children are involved in such things. And we kind of look the other way. Some people will say, well, at least they're not homosexuals. (laughs) Sin is sin, brethren. It doesn't matter. And one is not grosser than the other. It's all gross to God. And so... As parents and grandchildren and great, or great or grandparents and great grandparents, we need to raise these children knowing what God wants of them, knowing what God desires of them. Salvation's theme in, is indeed deliverance. It is God desiring to set free your children. God loves and rejoices in setting people free. That's what he's all about. He comes to their rescue. But we need to come to God as well in order to be rescued. But there's some more information provided for us in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, the great story of faith about these parents. Hebrews chapter 11 beginning in verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents 
because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. Brethren, this is a story of faith. This is a story not of unbelief, but of great courage because of their belief in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God that they threw all their trust in. And they said, our God will take care of our child. That's how much faith these parents had. And notice it says in verse 23, by faith when he was born, he was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was no ordinary child. That's the primary meaning of the word. The secondary meaning is something that is nice, beautiful. It means one, literally, of a city. One of a city. And so, in some passages, the same word is uh, translated as eloquent, or genteel, or uh, uh, refined. Refined. But I guess it's going to depend upon the context. I'm not so sure that you moms look at your child and say, oh, what a refined looking baby. No, you say, what a beautiful baby. And so it might make more sense here to use the word beautiful. But here it's the faith, not of Moses, but the faith of his parents. You see, what God has done in their lives is this. They have received the teachings about God. They have grown up hearing and being taught about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And not only about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the God of creation. The same God. He created everything. And then they learned about Noah and the great flood. And they learned about the dry land. And they learned about the sin of those great patriarchs. And they learned about the Tower of Babel. And they learned how God forced the people to go and live and speak in different languages. And then they learned about their great ancestor Abraham, who was called by God to leave his city, his home, to a land that he had never been to in his life. They learned all about that. And they had great faith in that God. And they lived for that God. And they put all their hopes, dreams, and trust in that God. They lived their life for that God. And it's demonstrated right here by the birth of their son Moses. Of course, the decree was, throw the babies into the Nile River. So they had nine months to plan something. Nine months. You see, they didn't have the way of checking out the sex or the gender of the child back then in those days. So they had to wait nine months to find out whether or not they're going to have a boy or a girl. But what would happen if they had a boy? What would they do? How would they react? You know, a lot of people, when they're faced with a situation, a crisis situation, they flee from God. They turn from God. They break under pressure. But these parents stood strong and with great courage stood up to Pharaoh. Oh, by the way, the writer here, Moses, Moses wrote this book. He wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And guess what? Moses wants you to know about the faith of his mom and dad. And so he writes this about his parents. And this great faith caused Moses to live. If it wasn't for mom and dad, there wouldn't be a Moses. If it wasn't for his sister Miriam, there wouldn't be a Moses. But all played a role. And they devised this plan, believing God would help. And you know that when we read that passage, Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. We haven't finished reading all of it. But when we read that passage, the word God is not even found in that passage. Oh, but it is all over.
the passage without it being there. It's about these parents putting their heart, soul, and trust in that God. And that's what they did. Because of God, they would not go into unbelief, into disobedience. This was their calling. This was their life. And they saw something special in their son Moses. And because of that great faith, they did what they did. Now, let's talk about the plan. The plan involved Jehoshaphat. It involved Miriam. And notice that the baby wasn't put in a basket and then sent down the river. You know, sometimes we think about that. Just think about all the, all the crocodiles that are in that river that exist today. All the hippopotamuses, all the other wildlife, the snakes, and all of that, that hang out in the Nile River. And so you would think, would a mother really do that for her child? Put the child in a basket and send it down a river? Well, this mother did not do that. This mother did what the Bible said she did, which was, if we go back to the chapter 2, it says they saw that he was a beautiful child. She hid him three months, but when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark, a basket of bulrush, uh, bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, and put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank, and his sister, Moses' sister, Miriam, stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Now, we pick up again the story. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. Lo and behold, she put the baby in a basket, protected it, put it in the reeds on the bank of the river, not out of sight, but just enough where people could see a basket and to hear a baby cry. And this princess, the Pharaoh's daughter, she goes to the same location. I wonder how that happened. Perhaps, and let me just say, you know, the Bible teaches in various ways. Sometimes it tells us something directly. Sometimes the Bible tells us something indirectly. And so it implies something. And we infer what it implies. And the implication here is so great. The implication is this. The mother knew where the princess was going to bathe. Because she saw her going to that location perhaps every day with her servants her handmaids, to go bathing there in the river. Probably a very safe location. And so she knew where to go, and that's where she hid the baby. And so, as we continue, it says, And her maidens walked along the riverside, and when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister, Miriam, said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? Oh, what a great idea. Why don't you do that, honey? Go find this Hebrew woman and she'll become the nursemaid and she'll wean the child. And they wean the child for several years. And she'll wean the child and then I'll adopt the baby. So here we have the sister, Miriam, as part of the plan. She's watching everything, and she's probably rehearsed this in her mind. And now she goes to the princess after finding the baby and says, Oh, we should get a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby. Great idea. Go do that. So who does she run to? 
her mother, Jehochebed. So Jehochebed enters the picture and she has a say in the life of her son. And so she's the one for several years nursing this baby. But notice what else. Not only is she nursing this baby, she's teaching this baby. And as this baby grows in years, she's instilling him baskets. Faith. Saving faith, just like that basket saved the baby Moses. And the idea is this. She's teaching her child. She has access to her child while weaning her child, teaching her child about God and about creation and about Noah and about the flood and about all the great patriarchs of faith and then about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Wow! And just think, Moses grew in wisdom, the Bible tells us. So, Let's go back to Hebrews again. And let's take a look now at Moses. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 24. So by faith, the parents did what they did. And now we come into verse 24, and it says, By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the, the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. He was taught a reward. He was taught about God. He was taught about heaven. He was taught about hell. He was talking, taught about righteousness and unrighteousness. And after viewing that in his mind for years, and even after being adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, the princess, and even after that, he stands up to the power of Egypt and says, I am a Hebrew. That's who I identify with. Why? Because my God is the God of the Hebrews. He didn't identify with the Egyptians. He didn't identify with all the wealth and the splendor and everything at his fingertips. He did not identify with that. But it was his mother's teaching. Yes, moms, you can influence your children. Yes, grandmoms, you can influence your grandchildren. And yes, great-grandmoms, you can still influence your children. It happens. God designed life that way. That the parents can still influence the children and the great-grandchildren. It happens. And so, it's by faith. Where do we get our faith? By the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. And so the Bible says, by faith, this is what Moses did. He said, I'm a Hebrew, not an Egyptian. So what does that mean? Where did he get his faith? Well, his mother taught him. But what did his mother teach him? The word of God. The stories that she was taught. The teachings of God. And so we find here that the parents did not fall ever into unbelief. And Moses, while he was away in Egypt and perhaps fell into unbelief, he had another opportunity of having great faith. And your children can too. The point being is this. Never allow your children to be identified with anything on this earth. Never allow your children to identify with any human being. Always have your children identify with God and with Jesus Christ. That's who they need to identify with. 
We're losing the battle, folks, because our children do not identify with God. Rather, they're identifying with what they're being taught in schools, what they're being taught by a culture that is godless. We need to get back, get back to instructing our children, instructing our great-grandchildren, instructing them, because it's the Word of God, the Word of God that brings faith and strength. The Bible tells us that the Word of God gives us great strength, Psalm 119, verse 28. The Bible also tells us in Acts chapter 20 and verse 32 that they were to be built up in the Word of God and given strength from the Word of God. And that's what we need to do. It's the Word of God, folks, that brings strength. And we look at the example of these parents and we see great strength because of their great faith. And then we look at the example of Moses and we see a young man, a young man, and he has great strength to stand up to culture, to stand up to the power and say, I am God's child. That's what we need. And it's because of faith and it's because of the word of God that can be done today. My prayer, and I think all of our prayers, is that our mothers and our grandmothers and our great-grandmothers will continue leading their children in the pathway, pathways of righteousness through the word of God. You're subject to the invitation of Jesus Christ. And you'd like to follow Jesus. Jesus says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. You can do that this morning. And you can be assured that your faith would have saved you because you did what Jesus asked you to do. There might be some here today who have wandered from the truth. But Jesus still says, come back, repent of your sins, and be restored. If you can do that today and you desire to do that today, won't you come together as we stand and sing?